examine the scriptures, God will reveal truth to them and lead them to Christ. 13. But when the Jews of Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea, they came there too, stirring up and inciting the crowds. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed, and so Paul arrives in another city, the city of Athens, and he's ready to preach Jesus there. Athens. The very best scholars were there. The very best statesmen and military minds were in Athens. It was the top city in the area of philosophy and education and arts. It was the place to be. Verse 16. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So, you know, that city was considered the home of wisdom and art. But that city the home of wisdom and art was also spiritually blind and spiritually insane drunk with idolatry drunk with superstitions drunk with sin Satan had a stronghold on it was filled with sophisticated high sounding spiritual rot look at verse 17 So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who chanced to be there. The marketplace was sort of like the coffee shop of today. The regulars gathered there every morning, you know, talked smart and solved the world's problems, I suppose. The marketplace was where the men met to talk about things and debate the issues. 18. Some also of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers met him, and some said, What would this babbler say? Others said, He seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, because he preached Jesus and the resurrection. The Epicureans were atheists. They lived to satisfy whatever they hungered for. The Stoics believed in God. They were different from the Epicureans. They believed in God. Even though they thought the gods were indifferent, they still believed in them. And the Stoics were strict. Just the opposite of the Epicureans. So Paul is talking to both these groups, both of these extremes, really. Verse 19, And they took hold of him, took hold of Paul, and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is which you present. Sounds like Paul was under arrest, the way it says that they took him. He's not under arrest. However, the scholars wanted to know more about this Jesus who he was talking about. As a result, they bring him to the Supreme Court, which is called the Areopagus. This is, of course, Jesus giving Paul another big opportunity to proclaim the Word of God is what it is. 20. For you bring some strange things to our ears, and we wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. They were always looking for fresh mental or emotional... They were always looking for a fresh mental or emotional buzz. Something new to consider. Some new religious ideas. That's what Athens was all about. They sat around in their academic dream world and devised theories. Verse 22. So Paul, standing in the middle of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. They were religious. They had a God for everything in Athens. And Paul will try to convince them, by the help of the Holy Spirit, all those gods are nothing. And what they really needed is the one God and His Son, Jesus Christ. 23. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. 
Even the idolaters in Athens knew deep down that there must be a one true God who made everything. They didn't know who he was, but they didn't want to risk offending him, whoever he was, so they built him an altar. 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by man. Unlike their idols, the real God is not confined to one place. The real God is not carried around by human hands. He made human hands. He is Lord. He is the highest and final authority. Verse 25. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. And that's one thing about God that we must always remember. He is self-sufficient, self-satisfied, perfectly fine. He doesn't need anything from anyone. He doesn't lack anything. He is perfect all by himself. Next time someone says, Oh, God created man because he was so lonely. Don't believe that. Sentimental. Tra- trash. I mean, it's, it's really, that's so degrading to God. He wasn't lonely. He is totally self-sufficient. He can get along just fine without anyone or anything because he's perfect in every way. Last part of verse 25. Since he himself gives all men life and breath and everything. God is self-sufficient. The rest of us are totally dependent on him. We could not even take our next breath apart from his grace continues in verse 26 and he made from every one excuse me he made from one every nation of men to live on all the face of the earth and look at this having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their habitation God places people and nations where he wants them to be the reason there are so many wars and so much trouble with individuals between individuals is that people and nations are not satisfied with what God has given them. They want what belongs to others as well. And so they try to take it. And that results in war. And that results in fights and murders and and whatever. 27. That they should seek God in the hope that they might feel after Him and find Him. Yet He is not far from each one of us. He's not far from any of us. That's because the real God is everywhere at the same time. You can't get away from Him. Verse 28. For in Him, in God, we live and move and have our being. As even some of your poets have said, for we are indeed His offspring. In other words, we live in God, we move in God, we have our being in God. In other words, the Lord God causes us to be the Lord God causes us to continue if God would ever withdraw his breath from us we would collapse instantly we could not move a muscle apart from God's grace every little movement we make every little movement is a gift from God the wide receiver I think he was on the Eagles last year. After a game, they were interviewing after a game, he said, uh, I would just like to thank my hands for giving me the ability to catch the football. That man's a fool. He's also out of a job this year. I'd like to thank my hands. He wouldn't even have hands. He couldn't even move a finger if it wasn't for the grace of God. It wasn't God doing it. And that's the gratitude he shows God. Verse 29. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, a representation by the art and imagination of man. Since God is everywhere, and since He gives us life and causes us to keep going, it makes no sense to believe that He is a decorated chunk of wood that some guy cut off a tree. These guys from Athens are such great thinkers, they should be able to figure that out just doesn't make sense verse 30 the times of ignorance God overlooked but now he commands all men everywhere to repent God's com- God commands repentance 
The plan of salvation is a call to repentance. Jesus has never offered a single thing to sinners who will not repent. He has never offered a single thing to anybody who will not repent. And so if we will not if we will not say God let thy will be done in my life if we will not say that then on judgment day God is going to say okay you have chosen your way now let your will be done you can live without me forever and it won't be good 31 because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and of this he has given assurance to all men by raising him from the dead in their supreme court and to the highest judges in the land Paul says you're going to be judged by Christ every leader on every level should know that Do you know that God holds them responsible for how they lead they will be judged 32 now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead some mocked but others said we will hear you again about this some mocked the word of God that's always a bad sign for those who do the mocking it's bad because the scriptures say that the message of the cross is foolish to those who are perishing so you mock the cross you're perishing verse 33 so Paul went out from among them the reaction wasn't all good but it wasn't all bad either at least some wanted to hear the word of God again don't be surprised if only some want what you have in Christ 34 but some men joined him and believed among them Dionysus the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with him so as we see, whenever the word of God is proclaimed, some will accept it, some will repent, and serve Christ. It may be a small remnant, but if it is proclaimed enough times to enough people, Christ will draw the hungry to him. The devil doesn't throw any shutouts against Jesus. Next time, chapter 18. Until then, so long everyone.